I want to personally thank each and every one of you for coming out to this forum. You could have been anywhere, and yet you chose to be right here to have your voice heard. Leaders from the NAACP, CERC, the African American Leadership Forum, and Delta Sigma Theta are proud to bring you the King County Prosecutors Forum. We have not seen a competitive race in nearly 15 years in one of the most important elected officials in the criminal justice system. Today we want to wade through the rhetoric, get to the root of the issues at hand, centering the voices of black people. The purpose of the King County Prosecutor is to seek justice. This is a unique role of all the attorneys in the system. They are more than just advocates for one side or the other. Instead, they are the moral compass in the process that they alone decide whether or not a person charged with a crime ultimately lose their constitutionally granted freedoms. Make no mistake, the responses given here today will allow us a glimpse into how the new prosecutor will view us as they go about their elected role. Please join me in welcoming representatives from each host organization. Bearcat Kuros from the Coalition for Immigrants and Refugee Communities of Color. Thank you, Sadia. Dear valuable candidates and community leaders, activists, and our partners, we are CERC, the Coalition of Immigrants, Refugees, and Communities of Color. Our mission is to build, inform, engage equitable communities. CERC established 10 years ago, believing an effective way to engage our communities is through active civic engagement. We hosted candidates forum that allows concerned citizens, in particular our communities of color, to become a better informed about their choices for elected officials. Third mission is to build, inform, engage equitable communities, and we do it in three ways. One, civic engagement, which includes candidate forum, advocacy, voter registration, get out to vote. Two, community engagement, which includes building our network of members, CBOs, local business, as well as culture, arts, civic engagement events, and lastly, our youth media program, which provides media, journalism, skill training, workshop, community-based projects to fulfill our mission in the creative grassroots youth lead. We have held annual candidate for almost 11 years. Oh, hard to believe. That's due to the relationship between immigrant, refugee communities of color, and African Americans. Whether it's public, safety, election or other county governmental service, accessing county service presents a special challenge to those unfamiliar with this county and our government setting in particular. CERC has been a leading advocate for equity in the, front, in the forefront for decision making that will impact immigrants of our county who face greater barriers of equity. We invite you to join CERC it's a growing network and the pros to help our community on every level from grassroots organizing, youth program to civic engagement and policy advocacy. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. My name is Don Bennett and I represent the NAACP and African American Leadership Forum. NAACP has come out to South King County to bring attention to some of the issues when it comes to multiculturalism out here in South King County. My president also reminds me that we are from, for all of King County. Although I continue to press South King County, she has allowed us to come out here to Kent to um, bring some attention to some of the things that are going on here. I want to introduce you to my president. Stand up, Carolyn. Okay. Vice President of NAACP. We wish to have civic engagement with our young people while we continue to have civic engagement, engagement with you older people. You old people, gray-haired people, us. But we have to bring youth into the fold, and this is part of that. We have to bring South King County into the fold. This is part of it. We'll continue to stay out in South King County because there's a lot of BIPOC issues out here that we wish 
to um, tackle with. The other thing that I represent is African American Leadership Forum. As you can see, African American Leadership Forum is in uh, our main goal is to do work in the five areas that African Americans, including the whole BIPOC community, the five areas that we are, are have low numbers in. That is child welfare, education, economic prosperity, health and wellness, and the big one that has to do with tonight, law and justice. We want to make sure that we are included in education and included in conversations that have to do with some of our young um, African-American, young BIPOC young people um, being in prison. So thank you so much, and I'm going to throw it on over to our lady. Thank you, Sadia. Thank you. Delta Sigma Theta Sorority was founded in 1913 on the campus of Howard University. Those 22 young determined women set out on a course to impact history. And their first act of service was that of social action. They showed their power and determined future national president, Lorna Humphrey Bailey, to charter the Seattle chapter of Delta Sigma Theta. Today, Washington State is home to five alumni chapters in Bellevue, Tacoma, Spokane, Seattle, and the future national president, Lorna Humphrey Bailey, to charter the Seattle chapter of Delta Sigma Theta. Today, Washington State is home to five alumni chapters in Bellevue, Tacoma, Spokane, Seattle, and the Columbia. I bring up our moderator, Mr. Clarence Gunn, who, who doesn't like a whole lot said about him, uh, but he is a political organizer for CERC, and he will be leading the. Well, thank you, everyone. Appreciate everybody being here this evening. As, as Sadia said, uh, it's, it's a Friday evening. It's uh, reasonably nice outside. It's not too hot, not too cold. Um, it's, it's still summer, so we have a variety of things to do this evening. So thank you for being here um, with us this evening. Bob uh, is the political programs coordinator for Circus to help coordinate and organize these kinds of community events and uh, do what we are aware of. Uh, the issues and have an opportunity to hear directly from the candidates about uh, some of the issues that are important to them. Um, in that role, uh, I've contacted all of the candidates, all two of them, <laughs> and in this particular race, and uh, they both agreed instantly. You know, I, I didn't have to you know, chase them down or follow up or, or anything. And even today, when I sent the final reminder email, uh, you know, like within an hour and a half, you know, I got yeses from everybody, so it was, this was uh, good news, uh, you know, for this evening's event. Um, the, the process is going to be pretty straightforward in terms of the, the questioning. Uh, the candidates will be given a minute and a half for opening statements. Uh, then uh, we'll go to some questions. We have some, some panels here, and I'll introduce them in a second. Uh, and we'll have a minute and a half to answer those questions. We have a representative from the Afield Randolph Institute, Guy Ashley. Guy will be the timer, and have you explained, or do you need to explain? Okay, uh, it's a dark room timer when it comes to the end. I've got cards that have one minute, 30 seconds, and 10 seconds. So there's no surprises. Okay. We'll stay a little close to on track uh, with the with the timer. Um, we have a number of questions already prepared. As I said, I'll introduce the panel so we'll be asking those questions uh, shortly, and they'll go through those questions. There are there is an opportunity uh, for two or three questions from the audience. There are index cards that have been passed out. Correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, so. We, those have been passed out. We'll collect those throughout the evening, and as we start getting close to the end of the prepared questions, uh, you know, I'll make a last call, and uh, you know, the Saudi and Don and company will um, will. Hmm? Sure. I sincerely apologize. One of the things we want to do at the very beginning that we forgot to do was to acknowledge all those individuals in the room that are already in elected office. We want to say thank you. Going on throughout the month of October, I'm 
in the process now of working with Don and Bearcat and other uh, partner organizations uh, to, to pull those together. Uh, so thank you everyone for being here. So let's see, we said the time limit for the opening statement was a minute and a half. To answer questions was a minute and a half. Uh, then we have questions from the audience. We'll collect those as we start getting towards the end. We'll collect those. Uh, Don and Sadia and some others will be making the rounds and, and collecting the cards. And then, like I said, we'll check one or two uh, or three, depending on which time we have, uh, you know, to, to be able to ask for questions from the audience. Um, let's see. Um, oh, one thing, as we, as we uh, go through the process and we'll figure out who goes first in terms of the opening statement, the other candidate will go first in the closing statement. And we'll do that kind of back and forth throughout the session so everybody doesn't always get the first question, you know, kind of back and forth kind of thing. And you already have your mic up there and it's all tested and making noise already. There you go. Good deal. <laughs> all right. My tech team is great, and I, I need to acknowledge yeah, them right are. now. Ali is over there, Mr. Barakat from CERB, uh, both of them from CERB. Ali's also from the LAMA, the Washington African Media Association. Yes, all right, got it. Uh, so we'd like to thank them for their support. Uh, this is being live streamed, so uh, there are a number of individuals, I forget what the number was, um, there were 430 something hits on the in invite, and I forget how many uh, replied. It was over 40 something last time I heard. So, uh, she thumbs up, so I'm, I'm close. Um, so, um, you know, we got a pretty good audience out there, in addition to the folks that made it here tonight. So, thank you for being here. At this time, I'm going to. Uh, uh, ask the panelists that will be asking questions to introduce themselves. We have Scott Nelson, who's been with us before during the primary session or the cycle that we had, uh, Lakinia Moss, and Esther Kobogo. Yes, <laughs> all right, good deal. Uh, let's see, uh, Lakinia, got it, okay, uh, is from the African American Leadership Forum, as is Esther. And Scott is on the NAAC, NAACP Political Action Committee. So uh, there we go. We'll get started with that. There's the kind of background. Hopefully there are no questions from anyone. It looks like we're good to go. Oh. Anyway. Uh, let's see. With that, let's see. Have we decided who was going to go first? I didn't bring a call. I do have a call. You'll defer? Okay, thank you. So we'll let Lisa go first, which means you'll, during, when we do the closing, you'll uh, go uh, first in that. I'll make a note. And so with that, we'll go ahead and begin the, the forum. Let's Great, so. thank you so much. It's so nice to see so many long-term partners in the room. Thank you for having us. You know, making our community safer, reducing property crime, protecting victims, and reducing racial disparities requires proven experience and hands-on leadership. Serious challenges like the pandemic, the murder of George Floyd, and our housing and opioid crises have challenged the health and well-being of our King County communities. Our challenges are complex, but we can and must do better. I have dedicated 27 years of my career to public safety and public service. As a career prosecutor, I'm the only candidate who has experience implementing effective crime prevention and diversion strategies. For me, it's about ensuring that all of our communities are safe and supported but identifying common ground, building strong coalitions, and working together in partnership to get results. As a chief of staff, here are some ways that I've delivered for our community. I have enhanced victim services by adding 10 advocates, including two who are bilingual. I have created a new hate crimes unit, and I formed a public integrity unit dedicated to reviewing officer-involved shooting of police use of force cases after the passage of I-940. And there's still important work to do. And we know that finger pointing and blame will not improve our communities. Instead, it takes innovation and a focus on outcomes. And as your next prosecuting attorney, I will lead on critical issues and I will hit the ground running to build a fair and transparent justice system that protects public safety and promotes and advances racial equity. Welcome, everybody. I'm, my name is Jim Farrell, I'm from King County Prosecutor, and I'm running because, you know, I've got a very unique uh, background. You know, not only was I a senior deputy prosecutor uh, for much of my time at the prosecutor's office, I was actually in the King County Prosecutor's office for 16 years. 
Prior to that, I was a city prosecutor for three years, uh, and so a total of 19 years in the field. And I probably, you know, handled hundreds of jury trials. I was the first ever domestic violence uh, court supervisor. I, I you know, served actually uh, that that occurred right next door in the building, uh, right there. So, but I also have led a city uh, for the past nine years, and just about nine years. Uh, a workforce of 600 individuals, a $100 million budget, 150 officers, and you know, I represent and work for 100,000 individuals uh, in the city of Federal Way. So, you know, during that time, I'm very proud of what we've done. You know, we brought the, uh, the first ever uh, domestic, uh, excuse me, the uh, DEI coordinator, domestic, the uh, uh, DEI coordinator at the city of Federal Way, the first ever uh, Juneteenth celebration. We've had three now. Uh, really, we're there uh, for the very first ever uh, a federal Way Black Collective meeting in which we're really bringing together uh, uh, voices of the community, working together. And we have done crime prevention strategies in the city of Federal Way. And really, I can tell you that both my work leading a police force in the city and also as a, city, as a, uh, 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 as a deputy prosecutor, um, you know, one of the things that I was uh, always concerned about was justice. And it's something that I'm committed to, and I look forward to uh, uh, talking to you further. Thank you. Back around in that in that fashion. So with that, I think we're ready. Here we go, Mr. Scott. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so the first question: Trust is a key component in relationship building. Trust in the criminal justice system among the Black community is nearly non-existent. What steps do you propose to develop rebuilding the trust? particularly among communities that are most affected by incarceration. You know, I, I couldn't agree more, you know, when the several have intentionality and, and really bring people together, which is really one of the things I've really tried to do as the mayor of City of Federal Way, is bring the community together and listen very carefully. Thank you. You know, first and foremost, we cannot deny the lived experience of our black community. We know that there are racial disparities in our criminal legal system and that there is inherent racism built into our system because the data shows that. And if we can't acknowledge that, if we aren't intentional about that, we will never dismantle the racial disparities. Under my leadership, I intend and will invite the participation of the black community. I want our BIPOC communities at the table crafting justice with me because we can learn from your lived experiences we also need your good ideas and your leadership, but most importantly, we need your trust. And one of the ways that we are going to dismantle racial disparities is to apply a race equity tool to our work. We have not done this in the prosecuting attorney's office before, so we are going to need the leadership of those who know this type of work and who can lead us and also point to us in the areas where we have institutional blindness. Under my leadership, I have, in, I have implemented mandatory implicit bias training for all of our employees, mandatory cultural competency training for all of our employees to get to the heart, to improve fair and impartial decision making, but also to better understand race and how it intersects with the criminal legal system. Also under my watch, we were the first prosecutor's office in the country, or I'm sorry, in the state, to implement data dashboards that show our racial demographics for referrals and case violence. Thank you. Question number two. As the relationship with criminal justice system and black community continues to erode due to over-policing, over-zealous prosecution, and excessive sentencing, how will you use your office to address these particular systemic issues that plague our system? Well, again, first and foremost, I'm inviting our BIPOC communities to the table of craft justice with me. And I think we also have to acknowledge that the cries to defund police that was a cry against generations of harm to our communities and to our black community. And so when I think about reform, and I think about the reforms that were in place after I-940, not only do I support them, I formed a public integrity unit dedicated to reviewing officer-involved shooting and police use of force cases. And because of that work, I intentionally declined to seek the endorsement of any police guilds or unions because the review of those cases would not appear fair, but more importantly, would not feel fair if I'm endorsed by police guilds. Because people have to feel that the system is fair, not just be told that it's fair. Thank you very much. 
you know, with regard to you know, I with regard to filing decisions and about um, you know how to approach individual cases, the prosecutor's office has a filing disposition standard book with regard to how to handle individual cases and, and types of cases. So I think that you start with the, make sure that your policies are good, make sure that you understand that you know you're taking a look at you know uh, how in, uh, what your policies are in regard to how you're going to handle certain types of cases. But I also think you need to go a step further and make sure that where you know, there's no tolerance of, of officers that have engaged in misconduct, there's, uh, you know, have ended up on the Brady list. Uh, I think it's very important to make sure uh, that we have you know uh, areas of transparency and. And really, I think the prosecutor's office has a tremendous amount of discretion that if, if the only way they can move forward in a case is with an officer that is tainted by prior misconduct, they have the discretion not to. And I think it's all, we, the prosecutor's office needs to be very clear with law enforcement agencies in their cities that they're not going to tolerate uh, misconduct. And, and uh, I made a policy in the city of Federal Way before it was mandated that we were not going to do vascular restraints, that we were going to use our federal money to get um, uh, body-worn cameras, any officer that ended up on the Brady list prior to misconduct for dishonesty would be immediately terminated in the city of the other way. So those are some steps. Bell system point to the tendency to criminalize poverty. What is your opinion in the value and impact of King County cash money bail system? If not cash money bail, how do we ensure a return to court?